So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy to be here today, even if I'm not going to talk about Web 8.0, uh, the latest space, mobile, whatever, which you would have expected for those who know me longer, maybe a few years ago. I'm still on the field of innovation, and I want to tell you a little bit how I see the future at the moment and why it's so important to be an active part of it. So, I was born in the 60s. I am the guy left side uh, with my father. And when I grew up, it was a time in Germany that we called the Wirtschaftswunder, the economical wonder. So my idea of the future was like limitless. So there is no limit to growth. There is no limit to fantasy. There was only one threat. It was Godzilla. But um, it turned out that um, it was not the most important threat. When I see today to what we call the future, I'm much more concerned than I was in the 60s. Because we're facing some global challenges, and we will all be part of it. Every one of us will have this. And there is some very inconvenient truth, which we might ignore, but I think it is important not to do. And of course, there is discussions, discussions about scenarios. So is there, for example, global warming or isn't? So um, I brought you the official, the most official statistics on temperature rise since we measured temperature. And here you can see a trend, a tendency. And I think it is not to debate this chart. This is purely scientific facts. And we have to deal with that. So what is the challenge? Last year, on the latest climate conference in Cancun, we decided at least one thing. We decided that it would be a good idea to stop global warming with two degrees. And I show you later what it would mean if we wouldn't stop it. So what then would be to do if we wanted to stop global warming to two degrees? Actually, we would have to transform our whole life our whole industries, our whole systems, our whole ways to produce goods and services. And here is the figures. If we want to keep to two degrees warming, we have to lower CO2 emissions compared to 1990 by 80%. And what we calculated, you can't see it really properly because it's a dark chart. What we calculated then is what would this mean to do so? Sector by sector, industry by industry, mobility industry, waste, transport, and so on. And you see efficiency, optimization of the things we have and we're doing will by far not be enough. By far not be enough. If we really want to hit this target, and I would say it's possibly the biggest challenge of mankind ever seen, if we want to hit this target, we have to reduce. And there is things like, for example, here there is waste. And we learned from Nokia, for example, with the packaging, now it's recyclable and so on. We have to reduce waste by 100%. So you might ask, how could we do that? Uh, wherever we consuming and producing goods, there will always be waste. Not necessarily. We can reuse that waste if we produce in an intelligent way, cradle to cradle, for those who are interested in it, is some of the <coughs> most promising approaches here. But let's actually see the facts and not debate in a kind of much emotional way. Let's go to the facts. Here, when we started looking at these figures in 2006, that was the chart. So in, in 2006, China was already biggest emitter of CO2 gases worldwide, followed by the US and so on. You have here some different regions. So 
What we have done then was we took a calculation down to what does that mean per capita in a region or in a country. And you can see here, for example, in China, there is more than 1 billion people living. So per capita, this CO2 emission is 4.7 tons a year. In the US, there is much less people living. Per capita, it's 19.3 tons a year, and so on and so on. So, and then we calculated some kind of a budget. That means we can calculate how many particles of CO2 can fit in the atmosphere to stop global warming with two degrees. And by seven billion people at the moment, we would all have individually a budget of three tons CO2 emission per year. So that is, the rod, that, that is this red block underneath. And then you can see, OK, we pass it in Germany. India, for example, of course, is not yet on the three tons. Might be soon, but still, it's not. So, and then you can follow these figures. This was 2006. Now let's have a look to 2009. And you all know that since at least 10 years, we're discussing lowering CO2 emissions. We are not <laughs> discussing how to extend them. But even in 2009, you remember, it was the year of the economic crisis. So industrial production even went down. You see the effects. So China, you see USA lowering by the economic crisis a little bit, EU, Russia, and so on and so on. So India, for example, jumped from here in, in that perspective already 40% in three years. So they will be also soon hitting the three tons limit. And now that's the thing that I'm worried about most. Does anybody of you know how the CO2 emissions have been in 2010? I'm always asking this question and always nobody can give me the answer. The thing is the following. Four weeks ago, the International Energy Agency, who is actually delivering these figures, delivered the figures for 2010. And here is the result. We have a new record high. We have plus 5% CO2 emissions from 2009 to 2010. So there is not even a tendency that we are lowering it, not even a tendency. We are accelerating, never seen before. And it was all in the news. This news was spread four weeks ago globally. Believe me, in every newspaper and every portal, you had this information. And there was information like, OK, with these CO2 emissions, we will not make the two degree limit. All the scientists said, forget about the two degree limit. It's already gone. And now I'm going to show you what's happening if the world would be warmer by three degrees. If the world warms by three degrees, the Arctic is ice free all summer. The Amazon rainforest is drying out. Snow caps on the Alps all but disappear. El Nino's extreme weather patterns become the status quo. The Mediterranean and parts of Europe wither in searing summer heat. This could be our world plus three degrees. In a three degree warmer world, these kinds of summer heat waves will just be the norm. So an extremely hot summer by this point will actually bring the kinds of temperatures into Central Europe that you now experience in the Middle East and in Northern Africa. The summer of 2003 may have opened a window onto life in a world that's three degrees warmer. All across Europe, an unrelenting heat wave developed into a natural disaster. Paris tends to empty in the summer. Many elderly stay behind. Nobody could have anticipated the danger they'd be in. Emergency room doctors were the first to realize something was terribly wrong. Emergency room doctor Patrick Palou quickly realizes the heat wave is turning into a catastrophe. 
Vous avez une telle vague de chaleur. You had such a heat wave comparable to a flamethrower igniting an entire area. The number of people who died on the night of August 10 is between 2500 and 3000. The death toll would top 30,000 across Europe. In France alone, over 14,000 died in just a few weeks. So, um, I don't know who really remembered this seven years ago. And uh, it is, like he said, it is like a little window to what we can expect every year. And middle Europe, with three degrees warmer, will have about the climate of the Sahara. Italian, whole Italy, will be like the Sahara today. So it's a dramatic, it's a really dramatic thing. But it's not only CO2 emissions. I brought you a second issue we should look at, amongst others, of course. And it's the resources issue. So you know we have now 7 billion people on the planet. We are consuming like hell. And what this chart show you is we can calculate the physical biocapacity of the Earth. And as you can see in the chart, already in the mid-80s, we consumed more resources than Earth is providing us. And our debts were also accelerating dramatically. So and here is the background. Who is consuming these resources? How does this work? And I have you now some figures about the part of the world that we call the developed nations and the part of the world that we called that we call developing nations. Just to give you the figure, these developed nations we are all living in is one billion people on Earth, and the others are six billion people on Earth. And here's the figures. So we have a portion of 90% of global population size. We are not growing any longer with our population. We have 85% of the wealth and the income globally. We are using 88% of the resources globally. And of course, pollution and waste also with 75%. That is our lifestyle. That is the lifestyle of these one billion people we are part of. But there is the rest. There is the six billion, the others. And what do they want? They intend to share the same lifestyle. They also want cars. They also want luxury. So, and here is some figures I'm living half in Germany, half in Morocco. Here is the GDP growth of Germany of the last five years. And you can see the baseline is zero. I'm living the other part of the year in Morocco. And here you can see GDP growth in my second home country, Morocco, which is most of the time a double digit figure. And I have you the growth of China and the growth of India. So double digit growth. And I just come back from China. I traveled to China all three, four, five years. And it's really, I don't know, fascinating or shocking how fast this development is going. It is simply unbelievable. Or let's turn it that way. It is never seen before. The speed, the acceleration of growth, of industrial growth, economical growth, and growth of consumption is something new, has a new quality. We've never seen that before. And here is the projection to 2050. It's done by Goldman Sachs. And they predict in 2050 that China will have passed the United States even by the double. India in 2050 on the level of the USA today, then Brazil, Indonesia, the BRIC states, of course, Germany falls back in the line. That is the projection. And I would say it is a very realistic one. The world order has already changed in my eyes. Asia is the place to watch. Uh, today it's certainly China to watch most, uh, but India close behind. So, and resources are a complex topic, but there is one resource for us humans that we really badly need, badly need to survive. It's water. And McKinsey calculated that in 2030, the demand of water will be 40% higher than the water we got. Or one third of the global population will have not enough water. 
And this is the latest news. I picked it just a couple of days ago, 21st of June. This prediction was corrected. It will come sooner than we have thought. And uh, already in 15 years, we will see that. And we will see regions drying out where today hundreds of millions of people are living. So the prediction of the so-called echo refugees that can no longer live in their space due to lack of water is about a billion in 2025. And maybe some guys think that this could be a solution. So for example, if Bangladesh is running out of water, maybe we build a wall or something like that just to keep them in Bangladesh, because neither India nor China want to have 100 million Bangladeshi refugees. So that's no concept. And I could go on and on. I could really tell you about challenges we're facing. It's really the time to rethink everything we're doing. And when I'm always telling this to people, they say, yeah, but come on. There is a huge fraction of people who are saying, technology will fix that. We will innovate. We will invent new things and be sure we cannot go under. I don't know because others did it. If you, I can really strongly recommend a book from a guy called Diamond, it's called Collapse. And he analyzed actually eight big uh, civilizations, how they came up and how they went down again. So, but the historical quality is different. For example, when the Romans disappeared, and this is the old Roman, the decadent old Roman, we had 500 million people on the planet. We had no nuclear technology. We had no mass distraction weapons, technologies. So even if they would have, they, had, they, they would not even been able to destroy the planet like we are doing it today. So now the question is, what are we going to do now? I think if you really understand this and be conscious about it, you cannot do nothing. And that was my intention two and a half years ago, to say I have to do something with that. So we dived into history and we wanted to see, was there ever in history a fundamental paradigm shift? And that's what we need. With an unbloody, in an unbloody way, there was fundamental paradigm shifts by revolutions, by wars, and so on and so on. But there was one also in history that was unbloody. Even that period of time was very bloody. It was the Dark Age, and sometimes I think we still live in the Dark Age again. But after the Dark Age, it came the Renaissance. And I think it's a beautiful term, the Renaissance, the rebirth of something. In this case, the rebirth of the antique knowledge, the rebirth of science, and so on and so on. So if you look to the Renaissance and how this uh, started, there was four guys, actually, who initiated this new thinking, Galilei, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Botticelli. And what is remarkable when you see this picture? It is remarkable that these are for Italians, and not for English, and not for American, and not for German. Why is that? It's because of him. Lorenzo de' Medici was a very rich, uh, part of a very rich family in uh, Florence at the time. Much money, but no influence. There was no bourgeoisie. There was the Dark Age. So and he wanted to become influential in society and change this paradigm. So he had a cool idea. He built a house in Rome. And this house was called, and still is called, the Villa Medici. And he invited all these four guys to live and work in this house under one condition. It, has to be, it had to be an open house. It was like an incubator, a mental incubator of new thinking, of new ideas. And for example, Martin Luther traveled to Italy and spent six months in a Villa Medici before he postulated the Reformation thesis, for example. So this was a hub of new thinking. People could go there, they spread the word, and out of this activity came actually the whole 
Renaissance. So we thought that is a good concept. And we went to Marrakesh actually for also some good reasons, but due to the time I cannot explain everything uh, today. And we, we, had, uh, we, we rebuilt an old little palace in uh, Marrakesh and we opened it in 2008 and we started inviting people, thinkers, scientists, philosophers, artists, small groups, and we discussed our visions and we tried to develop new ideas, new systems, new models, and so on and so on. And it was really amazing. It took only a couple of months and those guys, we wanted to know this project, knew the project and came. And so we decided to institutionalize this a little bit more. We are building a platform that we call the Club of Marrakesh. And this is an interdisciplinary platform of innovators that we have grouped and we're working with and we're developing new models and systems. And I think if I'm often asked what I would consider our biggest problem, our biggest challenge, I would say it's managing complexity. Complexity has raised in the last couple of years so tremendously, just give you one figure, the amount of knowledge, total knowledge, in 1900 to be doubled took 60 years, six zero. Nowadays, it takes 1.5 years to double global knowledge. So we have a huge acceleration, we have a huge complexity, and we have to master this. This is, to me, the biggest challenge. So how can we do that? So, to say it with Einstein, we can solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. We strongly believe in that. So it's about new thinking. It's about new systems. We have to do it in a new way. It's not about optimization. It's not about cosmetics. It's not about a little packaging. It is rethinking everything. So these are the roles of people we talk to and we invited to be part of it. And we have actually two activities. We build up an academy, a leadership academy, and we're targeting global leaders, economical leaders and political leaders, and try to influence them, try to create awareness and try to work with them. And we have an incubator, a real incubator. So we're incubating projects. We are not only debating. We want to do one new project after the other just to inspire the world. So in here, quickly, I show you who is with us. Keith Bellows, editor-in-chief of National Geographic Travel in the US, one of the few people that traveled already more than 100 countries in the world. He can tell you a lot about globalization. Joe Gribble is a psychologist, a media psychologist and socio sociologist. And um, Hans Herren is, uh, has the UN Peace Prize, is maybe the innovator of agriculture and agriculture systems in the world. Gerald Hüther is a neuroscientist, a German one. It's about development of us, of the psyche, and so on. Sven Gaboyanski is running a think tank here in Germany. Joseph Kessels is the dean of the University of Twente and is a guru about organization development in the knowledge society. He's a very interesting guy. Perik Kanna is one of the closest uh, counselors to Obama. He designed the campaign for Obama and he was selected to be one of the most 75 most influential people of the 21st century. Jason Lambert, American friend living on Bali, we're working on the topic of bamboo architecture with him. Klaus Liedke, former editor-in-chief of Stern, biggest German magazine and uh, still a very high re highly recommended journalist. Inge Mismal is a psychologist. She's doing nation rebuilding programs, for example, in Afghanistan or Haiti. Um, Omar Nali is our uh, partner in uh, Morocco, in Marrakesh. He's organizing it in Marrakesh. Hannes Nimpuno lives in Singapore. He's half German, half Indonesian. And he's an arts producer, and he will be part of the production of the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games in 2012 in London, which will be a sustainable event, zero emission, and so on. Very interesting. Jana Palaske is a German actor in Glorious Bastards. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, Ratu Peranda is the high priest of Bali, he's a very high-ranked Hindu priest. 
Margret Rastfeld is an education innovator. She's running an absolutely stunning new school in Berlin and a uh, very interesting person. Bibi Russell was the first top model coming out from Bangladesh. And after her career of being a top model, she went back to Bangladesh and she, is now, she has now a biological fair, paid, fair traded eco fashion brand, very successful. Peter Spiegel was the alter ego of Mohammed Yunus. They both developed this idea of microcredits years ago. And Yu Tsang is a professor for intercultural management in Beijing and uh, Berlin, and she's our gate to China. So if you think now, oh, how nice, how cute the guy thinks we can select a few people and then change something, yes, we think we could do that. Uh, certainly not with our 25 people. We need you. Also, that's why I'm here. I want to win you for the idea to participate in that. So what we're about to develop is a platform, an internet-based platform, where we want to make collaboration on a global scale possible. Collaboration with our network, with our experts. But it's not only about chatting or communicating or sharing documents. It's about initiating projects. That's the interesting thing. And this is by far nothing definitive I'm showing here. This is a very naive first approach from our side, how we could develop such a platform. And when I met Harald and I told him, hey, Harald, maybe you can help me because I'm trying to develop something very innovative. It's a very important project. And he told me what he's doing here with MLove. That's why we decided, hey, OK, I will come here. I will show you all this. And for those who are interested and have some ideas, please join. Please come to me. We want really to build something very important. And we want to build it on a collaboration basis, open source, uh, and so on. So quickly, those who were with us, they have access to this platform then, to the academy, to the incubator, and to the expert network. That's the scheme. And the software should be a kind of white label development. That means we want to give that platform also to other organizations or even companies so that we can work together. So it's more like a satellite system. And we can even connect projects worldwide because we're sometimes identifying that the wheel is reinvented and reinvented and reinvented again because people don't know from each other. So we want to stick this together. And uh, this is the idea of this, of this software. So I can really, really personally tell you, let's take action. It is not 5 before 12. It is 12 or even beyond. I cannot say exactly. But I can tell you it's the time to act now. And we should not resignate, even if these figures sometimes that you're facing are really about that you had a good reason to resignate. Don't do it. We should innovate. We should be curious. We should connect. We should collaborate. We should open sources. And we should be the change. And not wait before the others will be the change. And our future starts exactly now. Thank you very much.